essentially he's saying we've got we can divide the contents of our mental consciousness we have our sensory consciousness which is really limited in its capacity for cognition but we give pow much power to our bodies don't we so if we get the sensory consciousness we've got the mental consciousness and as Lama Zoparimite puts it that's where the workshop is that's where the thoughts and feelings and emotions and concepts and opinions and ideas and viewpoints and 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 you know all the all the thoughts about math and music and intellectual stuff and emotions and feelings and anger and compassion and love and despair and subtle subtle levels instinct intuition the whole entire spectrum of our inner being that's where the workshop is that's the mental consciousness and that is what we have to learn to work with and learn to unpack and unravel in order very simply so okay that's what we have to do so what do we have to do well that means we have to understand the content so he divides all this massive soup of emotion in here super thoughts and feelings and emotions he divides them all into th buddha into three categories of states of mind it's not how we talk in modern science absolutely not they got the neurotic deluded afflicted unhappy you know Lama Yeshi has endless synonyms for these which we are for states of mind, which we are intimately familiar with attachment, anger, low self esteem, arrogance, jealousy, pride. We know these words intimately. And the Buddha is telling us that these are the main voices, all these are the expressions of the root emotional affliction, as they would call it in Buddhist psychology, affliction, the root delusion, the root neurotic state of mind that's so primordial, so subtle so primordial, so kind of absolute in a sense, in the way it drives everything, and that it underpins everything and really hard to get to. The final wisdom is when we uproot that one. But before that, we listen, we try to calm down the voices, the main voices of, they know this, this root one is called ego grasping. This is a misconception about the very nature of oneself. This is the real stuff of the wisdom teachings in Buddhism. But the, the, the initial stages are learning to become intimately familiar with your own mental consciousness. So the first category are all these neurotic ones, and we are very familiar with these. The next lot, there are virtues. These are our saving grace, love, compassion, wisdom, kindness, generosity, forgiveness. We know these intimately as well. Now, the third lot, I like to call them the mechanical parts of our mind. These are the parts that enable you to function, whether you're a murderer or a meditator. To be a good murderer, you've got to have good concentration, good mindfulness, good attention. These are necessary qualities. Good discrimination. If you shoot the wrong person, you'll be in trouble. You, they're the mechanical bits of the mind. They're neither neurotic or deluded, nor are they virtuous, but they're crucial pieces of part of our mind. So we forget those for now. We're interested in these first two lots. So the Buddha's point is this. The neurotic ones, the delusional ones, the afflicted ones, they're the unhappy ones, the painful ones, and they are the source of our own pain and therefore the, the source of why we harm people with our body and speech. It's not a, this is not a difficult concept, but it, it's like almost deceptively simple. It seems like that's too easy. How can you say... All suffering comes from these deluded states of mind. That's Buddha's analysis. That's his presentation, you know, which is kind of outrageous. So then the next lot, the virtues, they are the source of our happiness. They are the source of our happiness. So one way of putting the entire Buddha's path, even before we get to the final wisdom, is to lessen the neurotic ones and grow the good ones. Guess what, you know? But we're looking focused here particularly on lessening the neurotic ones because this is the first stages of practice in the wisdom wing. So, so what will be the results of your doing that? How would you benefit from that? There are two ways. One is, guess what? You become less neurotic, less depressed, less angry, less jealous, less suffering, more happy, more fulfilled, more content, quite literally. But the crucial piece, so you begin that, you get more contentment. But the crucial piece is because these neurotic states of mind have the very specific function, apart from being the source of your pain, apart from being deeply disturbing to you, they have this other function, which is quite unique to the Buddhist view. And until we understand this, we can't say we really understand Buddha's approach. They, they, uh, they cause us to not, they cause us to be not in touch with reality. 
And, that, and that's not some cosmic thing in the sky, reality. Reality is just how things are. And why is that? Because they distort. That's their key function. These neurotic states of mind, they, they, they're called also delusions. That's a brilliant word in English. You know, in, I mean, I think in some languages, you know, Italian and Spanish, it's not a very, not a very kind of, it's not a word that's used, but in English it's delicious. And it really hits the nail on the head. The Buddha's telling us the extent to which I'm caught up in attachment and anger, let's say just two, is one, the extent to which I'm miserable and therefore harm others, but two is the extent to which I am not in touch with the reality of whether whatever it is that I'm attached or angry with. And it's not complicated when I'm super attached to chocolate cake meaning emotionally needy for it, can't stop thinking about it, believe that when I get it, I'll get happy. All of this anyway is not, is not wisdom, as ignorance Buddha says, but the key function of the attachment, being a delusion, being emotional affliction, but having this delusional component, what it does quite literally is exaggerate, distort, embellish the deliciousness of the cake. And it causes the cake, we know this, to appear, as Lama Zopra puts it, to appear back to us as divine, delicious, and definitely when I eat it, I'll get happy. So in other words, when you're, when you're seeing the chocolate cake or your handsome boyfriend through the lenses of attachment, you are literally not seeing reality. You're not seeing as they really are. You're distorting. The attachment exaggerates the beauty of the boyfriend. It blinds you from seeing anything else, not in a useful way. Because it's, it's rooted in, in 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 emotional hunger, and then you and then it, and then it, you and then this attachment causes you to manipulate to get the boyfriend to only do what you want, which is the driving force of attachment. So it's 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 riddled with lies within it. It's like itself is a lie, a misconception, and then because it's so habitual, it causes everything out there to be distorted. We're not literally not in touch with reality, and the and of course the other aspect of it is it's totally self centered. It's totally self centered. So then when we're living mainly when when attachment and anger and fears and jealousy and anxiety predominate, one you are utterly miserable. And you are locked, you are locked away from others. There's no sense of connectedness. There's no sense of empathy for others because you're so overwhelmed by your own misery, your own pain, because you, we're believing in these conceptual stories. This is why we suffer. And this is why we harm others. And this is why our compassion is limited.